Is it time to fade bonds? Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Real Vision Daily Briefing. With me today is Bob Elliott, co-founder, CEO, and CIO of Unlimited Funds. Hi, Bob. Welcome back. Hey, how's it going? It's going pretty well. It's going pretty well. We're kind of making our way through the first couple weeks of uh, the trading year. And it feels like we're kind of a little range bound, right? We saw decent gains across the board for U.S. stocks today. We had the 10-year yield creeping a bit. Uh, up a bit ahead of that CPI Thursday, PPI Friday, but everything feels like it's just kind of been in a bit of a range as we wait for sort of new clues on the economy and the Fed. So what are you expecting from the inflation reports? Well, I, I think uh, I think everyone's sort of taking a beat after was what was uh, one heck of a couple of months there uh, finishing up last year. Um, and uh, I think some of the internals, though, are, are starting to get interesting in the market. So even today, just a really simple dynamic where stocks were up and bonds were down starts to get to something that is um, highlights a different market dynamic than we saw in the last couple months and ones in which one in which. Um, the growth story may be a more important story in terms of what's going on than the inflation one. And so, you know, what's going to happen on Thursday with the CPI report is it's probably going to be not that interesting, which I know uh, is probably not something that gets clicks in terms of uh, news. But, you know, pretty much we're going to be in the 0.25 to 0.3 month over month core, a little lower on headline. That's still a little elevated. Um, relative to the Fed's, you know, target. And so it still keeps that concern out there in terms of whether the Fed really is going to deliver all those cuts that are that are getting priced in. Yeah, I think I guess that's what you're getting at with the with the growth story being more important, right? You know, as so we know that runaway inflation is better behaved. Um, but just Ha- what happens with the economy that's going to prompt the Fed to go? I guess that's why the focus is on growth. So what are we looking at when it comes to that? Because now, like, if, if you look at all the easing priced in, we're, we've got a recession coming. But man, people have been off on the timing of that. Well, yeah, the, they have been. Um, and, I, and I think that's what's really interesting about the pricing. You know, the Fed has come in and said, we're probably going to do a couple of maintenance cuts over the course of the year, which... You know, you could quibble. Maybe that makes sense. Maybe it doesn't, given inflation's falling. But the Fed is not giving any indication that they're going to deliver the types of cuts that are currently priced into the market. Right? Those sort of between, you know, roughly six-ish cuts that are priced into the market through the end of the year. Um, and so, I think that's why growth is the real focus here, because if the economy is slowing rapidly. Given that inflation is relatively contained, maybe not fully dealt with, but relatively contained, that gives the Fed a lot of credence to start to move quickly. Mm -hmm. But growth isn't really deteriorating very much when you look at what's going on. We're seeing the compilation of the data for fourth quarter growth. It looks like we're going to be around potential growth uh, or a little bit above it. Actually, timely weekly indicators, uh, like the Fed's weekly economic indicator measures, which brings together 10 different measures, that shows growth actually picking up. And so you see that in claims data. You see that in some of the mortgage data that is contracting less rapidly than it was before, which is actually a positive for growth. And so all of those things sort of look on the margin like growth is probably picking up a tad here into the end of at the end of 23 and early 24, which really calls into question whether all those Fed cuts are really are, are going to get delivered that are currently priced in. So what's supporting the economy? Why are we seeing growth pick up again? Well, I mean, the first thing I'd say in terms of the economy, and 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 I think a big thing that many people missed is traditional like macroeconomic cycles are pretty boring. They're very slow moving. And so what we're seeing is just, you know, have has the Fed hikes, have they had some effect? Yeah, of course they've had some effect. And, you know, lots of people can point to the various corners of the economy where that's happening. But the overall momentum in the economy, particularly an economy where wage growth is growing at, you know, four to five percent, depending on how you measure it nominal and where asset prices, particularly stocks, are at all-time highs and, you know, house prices continue to rise, there's a lot of momentum in the economy and there's money that consumers have to spend. And if anything, the falling inflation has given them some more real purchasing power, which has been beneficial uh, to them continuing their spending behavior. And so all of those things are sort of combining. No one of those is probably a big enough deal to keep, you know, uh, to have a, a significant acceleration of the economy. But, you know, you put enough of these things together 
and we're getting, you know, a slight improvement in the economy from one that is already, you know, doing pretty well. Uh, yeah. And so that's, that's, you know, that's the basic story. So is if, if inflation is contained, although it's still elevated from the Fed's rate and the economy's chugging along and doing all right, I mean, is this that kind of, uh, you know, all of the all of the phrases are kind of a, a, a bit overused. But is that is that that sort of Goldilocks soft landing, whatever you want to call it? I mean, is that a pretty good scenario uh, for markets, or is there something about that that we need to be thinking about in terms of the fact that future markets kind of look into the future? It doesn't sound too bad. No, I, I and I think it isn't all that bad, like, particularly from the stock side. If you hear that. You sort of say to yourself, okay, well, you know, what, what, what's the problem? <laughs> you yeah. know, like it seems like liquidity is ample, the economy's going well, you know, earnings would be in that in, you know, as as growth continues, will be, you know, fine to good, you know, and and if you go sort of bottoms up and you look at how this earnings season might translate, it looks like it'll probably be, you know, pretty good. Not not lights out the way it was, you know, when nominal GDP was growing at double digits, but it's still going to be pretty good. And so when you and when you look at stocks, you sort of say, I add that all up and it seems like it's a fine area, it's fine time for stock uh, you know, to hold equity risk. Um, and particularly maybe some of those sort of under uh, uh, unloved segments of the equity market that you mean have everything uh, except you know, all everything except the for Mag seven. seven. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. And I, and I think that's kind of what we're learning in the equity side of things. Like maybe these small cap companies are not nearly as badly structured and positioned for uh, you know a, a tighter monetary environment than you know people had expected um and so maybe we get some convergence you know we've we've seen a fair amount of rotation in the market but there's still some to go and then i think the real thing is on the bond side so there's so much pessimism priced into the bond market that it's just hard to believe that we're going to, you know, if we have a growth situation like this, that we're going to get, um, you know, the type of the type of uh, cuts that are priced in the economy. I, I said at the beginning of the year, sort of kick off the year, I said, look, if growth is, you know, at potential or a bit above and unemployment's at secular lows and inflation is, you know, in the ballpark of the Fed's mandate, maybe a touch higher than that, why should the Fed do anything? That, 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 yeah. you know, why, why should they, they, it seems like they're getting everything that they want. Yeah. Which, which is, I think what happened when Powell came out and they put the easing on the dot plot, because why did they do that when theoretically they could have just kept it chugging along? I think that that's what was the catalyst that got everyone going. I mean, there's two sides to that, right? There's the fact that they're pivoting. Okay, great. Preemptively perhaps pivoting. But the other side of that is, do they know something we don't know? Yeah. I mean, the Fed doesn't know anything that, that we don't know. I thought you were just going to stop at the Fed doesn't know anything. <laughs> I, doesn't know anything. I mean, I do think, I think, I think it's important. Too often people are trying, trying to, too often people think that the Fed has some sort of prescient knowledge. That's not true. The Fed is a terrible predictor of what's likely to transpire. They respond to the conditions that they see and, you know, and they act in ways that are relatively predictable in that way. But why did I they think, respond? Why did they, knowing that they were going to get a market reaction, they had to know that. Why well, did they float the idea of easing when they didn't have I think to? There's two interesting points. One, I think they they were surprised by the actual market response. Well, that's The market ridiculous. before that meeting was pricing in four cuts. And they said three in the dot plot. Now, normally what you'd expect the response to be is, oh, you expected four and we said three. That actually should be bad for bonds and bad for stocks. But the market basically took that and said, you say, you know, you say three and I'll double it, <laughs> you know, yeah. and really kept going. So, you know, you might think that that makes sense or not. I think the other thing that gets overlooked in terms of the dot plot is that it's not it, – you don't want to think about it just as from an outcome perspective, as if it's a predictive outcome. You want to think about it from a reaction function perspective. And in that dot plot also was a set of un unemployment rising by the end of 24 to 4.1, 4.2 in that, in that range. And so what they're saying is if we have a weakening of economic conditions and inflation is moderated towards our target, then we'll do some maintenance cuts. 
Okay, well that that's you know, you hear that combination of logic and you say to yourself, that's actually that seems like reasonable. That that's the monetary policy that I probably would run if I was in their shoes, given mm-hmm. the circumstances. But people too often forget that that important point, which is unemployment has to rise into the fours for those maintenance cuts to happen. Right. There's and a big very if. Hot. There's a big that's if a big in that. Yeah. yeah. In the context of growth that's growing above potential, I mean, you could, you know, I think one of the, the positions that's basically totally unpriced in the market is what if unemployment, the unemployment rate in 2024 falls? It's, 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 it's absolutely possible. Mm. And essentially there is zero probability priced, particularly into the short rate markets of an outcome where the Fed does little to nothing. And that is a very interesting circumstance given I'd say the weight of the evidence is that the probability of that is certainly higher than zero. Um, Yeah. So we have a lot of really good questions coming in. I'm going to get to them, everyone. Uh, If the bond market is too pessimistic, if these things have to line up, if they're they're sort of over their skis in terms of Fed rate cuts, and I think think you have a chart that shows like they've got way more... Factored in than the Fed. I'm not sure if that if we have that one or not. But um, where's fair value? Where should fair value be for the ten year in that scenario? What looks reasonable? Well, I think, yeah, I think you can easily see in the curve th- this chart showing uh, the Fed dots. It's kind of in, the Fed only tells us end of the year numbers, so it's mm-hmm. kind of guessing uh, when they'll do their three cuts that are in the dot plot. Versus the gold line, which is what's priced in the markets. This is at the end of the year. It's it's come up just a little bit uh, from the end of the year, uh, but the basic story is still the same. And so, you know, what does that look like? Well, I, I'd say, you know, even just moving from 150 basis points or 160 basis points of cuts priced in to 75 basis points of cuts priced, you know, that's a that's a 75 basis point move on the two year rate. And it's likely to occur in a circumstance where growth is doing pretty well and where we may get a curve steepening occur. Mm-hmm. And so we could easily see the curve, you know, are we going to retest five? I, I you know, maybe. I, I'm not sure I, I'm necessarily there, but you don't have to be there to trade this market, right? The first 50 basis points are a little clearer than, you know, the next 50 basis points. Uh, and so, you know, could we easily see, say, the ten-year move into the mid fours, back into the mid fours again? I think, given this compl- complexion of of circumstances, that seems like a like a very plausible outcome that we could see through the first half of the year. Mm. So, and I think that's the worry, right? That the two camps that are out there—that's the worry on the part of some that the bar market is just way ahead of itself in terms of what's going to happen from an easing perspective. Mark is asking if there's little or no easing, where are the danger areas on a sector or asset basis? Well, I think we just discussed the fact that bonds look ver- look look like they'll need to reprice. Would you expect, and it sounds like you're saying you can expect more of that on the short end. I mean, where, where would you be most yeah. concerned about bonds? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the short end pricing is the most extreme uh, in terms of the the mispricing, and we've seen a few cycles of this. Like <laughs> last I, I year, feel it like, killed everyone. How I mean, how many narratives did we have last year? We went from you know recession now to start the year, to higher for longer, to mm-hmm. credit crisis, to higher for longer, to you know Fed cutting you know cutting 160 basis points. You know we we, we go up and down, and I think this is kind of this is kind of the complexion of the market. Um, you know, if you, if you look back over the last 15 years, people have sort of learned to follow the trend. And so you wanted to catch the twists in the trend because the trends extended for a long time. But what we, what we've had really over the last 18 months is we've had the macro economy, sort of the aggregate trend of the economy sort of meandering, not really moving very much. Um, and you've had expectations whip around up and down and up and down, and you've actually been in a better position to fade extreme pricing than you have been to try and call the the mm-hmm. trend shift. And I think we're in another one of those circumstances where the pricing got a little overextended, particularly at the end of the year, and we're now sort of fading back to a more reasonable uh, pricing dynamic. I think what you ju- I just want to I just want to underscore that because I think that this is a really really important point because this is kind of a strategy, right? <clears throat> and I think you're 
really giving voice to the fact that everybody has recency bias and what, what serves you well is catching the turn, right? Getting ahead of what everybody else was a beat later on seeing. And that was a turn in the cycle. But you're saying now, or the turn in prices that identified a change in conditions. Right. What you're saying now is really, it's hard to tell what's going to happen. So be on the lookout for an overextension and sort of fade what looks like an extreme move because we've seen, it, it does that, does that mean there's more volatil- volatility? Does that suggest that we're just in a more volatile period and you're going to want to look out for those overextensions? Yeah, I, I think we've seen a lot of, of overextensions. Part of that, I think, is the uncertainty, a lot of uncertainty in the market about how it will respond, how the economy will respond to the monetary policy that we're seeing. Mm-hmm. And so um, it, it in, in some way, and and circumstances that people haven't really seen in their careers. So, like, you know, I think a lot of people, as an example, with the SVB <laughs> circumstance, didn't really have the benchmarks and the depth of understanding to recognize was this a cri- was this like a two thousand eight crisis or was this you know not that big a deal? Um, and so, you know, they went right to crisis because that was a bit of a, a framework that they had or an easy way to move mm-hmm. into the market and then backed off of that as they realized it's not that big a deal, all things considered. And plus the government responded to it. Too, yeah. Well, that's should, the other, that's what makes it confusing, right? So b- by the way, there, in, in my life in four trades, if you haven't seen it with David Rosenberg, he gives a great story about how he, how he started in 87 and the the biggest lesson he learned that day and his first day at work, which a couple of the people that's in our, incredible. <laughs> oh yeah, a couple of the people in our community, but I mean, like Brandy knew while well, eyes wide open. A couple of uh, people in our community, by the way, and you might be in the chat, have mentioned that that was also their first day, which is unbelievable. Is incredible. But um, he went around, and the conversations they were having were exactly that: is this a credit event or is this a solvency event? And your reaction based on what's happening, you know, is there a contagion that's going to grow throughout the system or is this, is this isolated in which case buy that dip with everything you have, right. which is the argument that his boss was making. And it turned out to be right. Um, yeah, and for so sure. that was like one of the important lessons. So really, really important to understand that. I'm glad you brought it up, Bob. But the problem is, even if you think, you know, you know, we've got these new vehicles that are being created by the government. And then, so that's, it's a little bit confusing as to whether, you can identify which it is because they act so quickly now. And in fact, the crisis unfolds so quickly that you don't have time to ask. You know, we, we talked about that, that instantaneous run on a bank is kind of unprecedented. So things are new that it, I think it's, it feels like every, it's hard for everyone to work through. In fact, Ralph is asking why I th- I'm going to, I think you missed a word or two in here, but I think we've got the gist of it. Why is the pickup in the BTFP, the facility they created, not yep. a sign of stress in the banking sector? No, no sign of stress in the banking sector related to BTFP. And I think uh, very important. I actually, I, I put out a, a tweet about a few hours ago highlighting, you can see um, the BTFP is structured in a way where you pay the one-year interest rate. And because there are cuts priced in, um, the one-year interest rate is lower than the deposit rate that you get at the Fed. And just as that arbitrage started to open, uh, you saw a pickup in borrowing. It's not. It's also not a big pickup in borrowing. The overall BTFP is less than 1% of aggregate deposits in the banking system. So first of all, we're not talking, BTFP is like a rounding error uh, mm-hmm. in the scheme of the overall you know, economy. It's like talking about Grand Rapids to have a conversation about the US economy. Uh, is like what we love you in Grand Rapids. If you're listening, Grand Rapids, no, no, no hate. <laughs> I I come from Michigan, so whenever I meet sort of a generic small town that you know, no oh, one you must be, really you must be very happy after the. Uh, I, I uh, 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 Mason blue through and through. My my uh, my parents retired, went to the University of Michigan, and retired there. So uh, they are uh, very excited. Um, uh, it's about time. Hopefully, it doesn't take. You know, twenty six years uh, for the next one. But we can uh, talk about where Harbaugh's going after this. But we don't have time for that. Let's stay focused <laughs> on the market. <laughs> this is not sports talk uh, Damn radio, it, it's even not. though okay, <laughs> we, we, we could we could definitely spend a lot of time talking about it. But um, but you know, I think I I, <laughs> I, I, I the BTFP is just is it's not that big a deal. It mattered in a moment. Right. There was a question of whether there was a the, lot that, in moment because right? it ring fenced the right. crisis of confidence that was unfolding. Ex- exactly. And whether it was going to metastasize. Mm-hmm. And what the government said is, is we're not going to let this metastasize. And if anything, 
the, the, the promise for it to not metastasize matters a lot more than the particular money in the BTFP. And then there's this goofy thing more recently about the, about the arbitrage thing. So, and plus they said that they're going to roll the loans that are in it on the date that it closes. And so there's some urgency if you want to take advantage of it to sort of right, move so it some forward. some technical, technical stuff some, going on. A bunch on. of technical stuff. The thing to look at is the weekly bank deposit numbers. Uh, you can get those, the H8 report comes out 4.15 every Friday. And what you see in the in the bank deposit numbers is deposits after the SVB thing have flattened out and they've actually improved in the last couple of weeks, which is an oh. indication that the issue is not a bank issue. Deposits are up, not down over the last couple of weeks, reflecting the fact that banks are doing pretty well. And so if you really want to nerd out on the banks, that Friday, 4.15, I don't know what you're doing Friday at 4.15, <laughs> Usually I'm cracking a beer open, putting my feet up, but, uh, but also looking at some bank data. <laughs> I, I love it. I love it. Listen, you, you, you are home with the, with the, with the fellow nerds, Bob. We love that. Uh, uh, data uh, everyone's going to be cracking I... beer this weekend because, um, Raul's doing an AMA at four o'clock. Mark your oh, calendar. Nice. So nice. you can geek out, nerd out and have your drink of choice. I mean, it doesn't get it. any better than that. So, um, you were talking about the impact of monetary policy. I just want to circle back because what you, we talked about that recession, no recession, credit crisis. Oh my gosh, it's overheating. And one of the things that was an issue in terms of monetary policy for the first time in a long time, and maybe something people didn't have experience with was fiscal. And yeah. Rowan Julian sat down for their monthly macro insider chat, talked about the role of fiscal stimulus. Let's listen to a clip from that and then we'll talk on the other side. I'm very much in the camp that we are now, you know, that politicians have discovered this new toy and it's going to be very difficult to wrestle it out of their hands. And even in places like the UK where, you know, I think the guilt um, crisis last year was testimony to the fact that we were risking that point where the bond market was saying, you know, enough is enough. The sort of fiscal limit, um, fiscal dominance kind of point, uh, which we've written about. Um, which I think is very dangerous and is a real threat to all those countries in the developed uh, world because of the, you know a lot of them anyway that are running very large uh, budget deficits uh, and current account deficits. Um, I just think it's hard to, it's hard to to track in real time. That full interview is on our website. If you are not a member, go to realvision.com and sign up. Uh, we've got all kinds of fantastic macro talk, crypto talk, everything you want to know, um, and in-depth, really smart stuff, which is why we're joking about being nerds. But it's really important to kind of dig in and reset. And this month is education month as well. So we're going to take you along on the journey if you feel like you need a refresh. So, um, And Bob, we need a refresh on fiscal, right? It's been a long time. But the point that Julian brings up is really interesting that, listen, now maybe they're addicted to this and we're going to, you know, even though we've got these blowout deficits, get more of it. Um, that's a big debate, but we are in election years in so many countries. I think I, I read someplace and someone can check this out. I don't know if it's right, but the most elections since 1800 or something like that all over the world, uh, people are going to be going to the polls. How are you thinking about this impact from fiscal? You know, are people figuring out how to track it? It seems like the lag from that getting into the real economy is really tricky. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, Fiscal policy has uh, is always a bit of a challenge because you have to track how all the money flows and and important to recognize the delays that exist in fiscal policy. Uh, I always like like to talk about um, after the the financial crisis, there was a you know a reinvestment act. And they kept working on a road by my house for 10 years, 10 <laughs> years after. You don't live in Boston. Big, it wasn't the gr big the, dig, was it? Right. The big dig went on for 15 years, 20 <laughs> years. But, um, but you know, that gives you a sense of these things is, is that the timing matters. And so as an example, you know, there was with the, with the infrastructure act, uh, you know, the money was allocated, the bonds were borrowed right? The, the bonds were issued to finance that, but it's going to take a while for that to actually flow through the real economy. And so that elevated economic activity associated with a number of those programs is actually like to, likely to peak here in 24. It picked up a lot, somewhat in 22, a lot in 23, but is actually going to go even further here in 24. So from a growth perspective, there's a lot of that um, a lot of that stimulus that's coming from those mm -hmm. sort of structural fiscal 
stories are that it's still in the pipeline, which is very interesting because essentially what we've done is we've engaged in a big fiscal stimulation at a time when the unemployment rates at secular lows. Mm. And part of the story of why it's taking so long is that a lot of state and local governments who are actually implementing the the infrastructure, they're the ones who build the roads. The federal government doesn't mostly build the roads, the state and local governments do. They actually like are struggling to find the people, to hire them, to build the roads because the, the employment situation is so right, tight. Right, which may so, not be the worst thing in the world. If this thing is stretched out appropriately, plus, you know, if you take it, you can, or you give it, you can take it away too. We can't, we can't, can't forget that. So, but it's, so it's tricky. It's tricky to figure out how all of that drifts down. And, you know, for those of you sitting outside the U.S., this is a, this is, as Bob pointed out, from federal to state to local to municipal, getting it out there. I mean, it's a long process. You know, the government doesn't move quickly. So in, in a good scenario, Bob, it kind of lays support underneath the economy. In a bad, in a bad situation, it's like, gasoline on something that's too hot already. Right. And and you've got right. to try to figure that out. And nobody seems to really know the answer to that, including the Fed, which is why these projections, like everybody's kind of doing it on the back of the envelope. So I want to ask you a question about stocks. I want to circle back to stocks. We've got some questions about, you know, what do you like in this environment? Um, what what does J and J asking? What sector does well in this kind of environment? You mentioned maybe those things that were undervalued. Seems like you think a rotation is if it's not necessarily going to happen. That's where that's where the the opportunity is. But if bond yields are going back up potentially to five and have to reset, how does that? Won't that hit the say small caps more? How are you thinking about that? Well, I, I think the the important thing is to think about the linkage here, which is that. The rise in bond yields um, that would come would come as a function of strong growth, mm -hmm. and so that's and so on the so that is actually a good thing for unloved corners of the equity market and that rotation story. And I think in general, when you look at the overall equity market, you know you've got that handful of you know that small handful of stocks that drove a fair amount of the rally in uh, in twenty three. But those are priced to perfection um, in in the sense of the they certainly could continue their their strength, but there's a very high expectations going on. If you start to talk about you know small cap value, you know it's priced for misery. Mm -hmm. um, and so you know getting something moderately better than misery, is uh you know is is could easily be a surprise to the upside for a lot of that a lot of those um a lot of those markets and so that's really where i think that the opportunity here is not necessarily to go with the trend of the previously hot performers but it's to look in those areas that have been unloved who are likely most likely to benefit uh from the continued strength in economic conditions and and frankly, some of the healing, some of the improvements in their balance sheet and their and their overall um, circumstances that they've taken while times have been a little tight here the last couple of years. And so, it, 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 I think that there's been some perception that small, small caps, smaller companies, you know, smaller to medium sized companies, um, are are just destroyed in a higher interest rate environment. It depends on how high the rates are and what the what the underlying economy is. It sounds like you're saying there is a situation where a strong economy with elevated interest rates is something that they can live with if they're doing well enough. It's not that higher rates are always going to wipe out or make the cost of borrowing so punitive that they can't that they can't thrive. That that's right, and and actually a, a lot of those um, a lot of the tension that we've seen over the last two years has challenged some of the crappiest ones of those, the ones needing uh, needing capital on an ongoing basis. Uh, and so, and, and have washed a fair amount of companies yeah. out. Great point. And so what we're left with, as an example, if you look at Russell 2K, uh, its average weighted average borrowing cost is 4.2%. You know, if nominal GDP is growing at five or six, uh, you know, a 4.2% borrowing cost is totally manageable for those companies, right? And a lot of them have found ways to term out the debt that they have. You know, the companies that's, that are still in those sectors are 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 um, have found ways to term out the debt, and so that they're you know they're they're actually benefiting, uh, not nearly as much as sort of the biggest companies from this environment, but they're not near in as nearly a bad a shape as uh, 
as as you might think. And 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 this chart shows um, back to through twenty three. But if you were to draw it even further back, of course, these companies uh, you know took some real pain over the mm. course of the last two years. And so I think there's there's even more catch up that can be done uh, on a on a longer term basis from these companies that you know really up until just a couple of months ago had been treading water for a very long time down think, for a while. I think that's a great point. I mean, it, the, all the, the weak hands have been washed out. If you survived this thus far, you've got to have a pretty tight business. That's, that's making sense, you know, um, and some good management to, to get to navigate through what we've just seen. So that's really interesting. want to squeeze in one last question. Uh, I'm not going to get specific, but Chris, it's a very good question. Chris is saying TLT, I get the chart is falling apart, but what about instruments? And he named an ETF. It's basically, uh, I don't want to get su- super specific, but it's a floating rate treasury fund. Any thoughts on that, Bob? Yeah, I mean, the, rate the, funds? yeah, the floaters and the, and the short and like bank loans and, and things like that float BKLN, SRLN have been great performers. You're seeing, you know, top line yields that are in the, you know, high, you know, in the nine to 10 range um, in an environment uh, where, you know, credit risks, you know, you're in a pretty good circumstance in terms of where you are in the capital structure um, and, you know, in an environment where the economy is doing pretty well, the, you're probably not going to get quite as much yield compression benefit as you've gotten uh, over the course of 23. But when you think about the overall risk return profile, I think there's a good, a lot of good compelling reasons why those assets continue to be, uh, you know, strong performers and why you might from a risk return perspective really find those very compelling um in in 24 and and what i'd say you know my sort of day job is figuring out what hedge funds are doing and how they're positioned they've really loaded up on a lot of these assets uh in mm. particular the floating rates on the floating rate on the short end seeing a lot of opportunity there uh to get differentiated risk return on it so i think it's a it's a very interesting compelling idea uh as we uh as we come into 24 Fantastic. Great question. Um, and this has been a great discu- discussion. Before we leave you all, I just want to, uh, Mario, can you throw that picture up? So as you know, in addition to take, like, taking a look at everything that's going on in the asset markets and across global finance, we've got a keen eye on technology. Check out this little thing, Consumer Electronics Show is going on. And this, um, I'm not going to call it a phone. It's sort of a phone, little tech gadget, AI-driven tech gadget is getting a lot of buzz. It's the R1 from Rabbit, a startup called Rabbit. David Matten has a lot to say about this, um, as well as everything exponentialist, and he's dropping a new show tomorrow. So if you're into tech and you're wondering what's going on, especially as AI starts to merge with hardware now, it seems like uh, you're going to want to tune into that. So we thought it was pretty cool. We had a discussion about, I don't know, Bob, it's like this big. What do you think? You're going to carry something like that around? I mean, I, I've got an iPhone 3 that's still trucking, so. Uh. <laughs> He's frugal and super intelligent. I love it. <laughs> that is hysterical. It's going to be, you know, it's like the, the car is, it's vintage now soon. So you may be like ahead of the next trend. That's right. If you if you only, you know, only have an old school phone and you can upgrade it every three years, it looks new to you. Exactly. <laughs> that's all that matters. I love it. Obviously, the Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger school of thought happening here. That's right. Uh, anyway, I think it's going to be, I'm really interested to hear what David has to say about it. Um, it's going to be a really interesting conversation. So I'm going to tune in for it. I hope you do too. Bob, great to have you on. Super discussion. Yeah, a lot of fun. And uh, great questions from everyone and great chat. Everyone's weighing in. C- Christopher has, I think, the most replies on his little foray into jumping on that, some of the crypto excitement, which has been really fun. We're still watching for the news, of course. Um, and like I said, until Gary Gensler calls me himself, we're not talking about anything, but um, we should be hearing something over the next 24 hours, we think. And when we do, we're going to have a lot of coverage on it. So stay tuned for that as well. Thanks, everybody. We'll be back same time tomorrow. In the meantime, take care and good luck out there. I've had an idea for the last three years. Something's been in my head and it's taken me a long time to get there, but now it's coming. The Real Vision Marketplace. The idea behind the marketplace is all of the people that you know and love, the research companies, we can all feature them on Real Vision, on the platform to make it easy for you to find the research that you want from third parties that are trusted sources. We curate this marketplace specifically for you from your requests. 
And what's also amazing is because this is Real Vision and there's a whole bunch of us, we get to negotiate incredible special discounts for Real Vision members. So it's a really unique way to build your financial world where you can get the research that you want from all different sources that you trust all in one place. And this is just the start of where we're going. So go to realvision.com forward slash marketplace, check it out and see what's going to work for you, how to leverage the best talent in the world, the brightest minds to create the biggest opportunities for 2024 and beyond. Enjoy it.